Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is part D of our seventh lecture on associations in the course on descriptive statistics and Islamic approach. In this lecture, we will study the properties of a fair coin and what is normal behavior for this and what is abnormal behavior. Fair coin is one on which we have equal chances of heads and tails. And uh, the question that we want to study is, how do we find out if a coin is fair or not? In particular, uh, when we flip the coin a large number of times, uh, there will be deviations from the perfect ideal ratio of 50%. So how large a deviation should there be uh, before we start to suspect that the coin may not be fair? How can we tell the difference between chance fluctuations and between genuine differences? Now, uh, this doesn't seem immediately related to the topic we are studying in this lecture seven. Uh, how does uh, this matter for associations? Well, it turns out that this is very crucial and central to the study of associations because two variables can appear to be associated by chance. And so we need to check if uh, uh, an association that we see is due to chance or if there is a genuine phenomena which creates this pattern of association that we see. Regarding the theory of probability, what does it mean to say that a coin is fair? What is the meaning of probability? This is a very complex and difficult philosophical debate. Uh, the reason for this complexity is the philosophy of logical positivism, which says that only observable things can be part of science. Now, when we flip a coin and we say that it came up heads, but it could have come up tails, then we are talking about something which is not observable. So basically, and the idea that the two events were equally likely is also something which happens in an imaginary world that in another possible world, uh, of which is equally likely to the current one, uh, the two outcomes, heads and tails are equally likely. So these statements cannot be understood in the logical positivist framework of mind. And for this reason, the natural definitions of probability have all been blocked and the search is still going on to find a good definition of probability. So we are not going to discuss this debate at all. I just wanted the reader to be, the listener to be aware of this. Uh, we're just going to take a very intuitive and qualitative approach. Uh, the standard approaches are very complex and they are all, uh, the, all of the difficulties arise because they cannot deal with counterfactuals and with the imaginary worlds that you have to imagine to understand probability. The main idea of this in this lecture are actually quite simple. We flip a coin a hundred times and um, 50 is the ideal, uh, but there will be some range of variation. It may be it's from 45 to 55 that we can expect that the uh, coin will uh, just not be exactly perfectly 50%, uh, uh, it might come out 45% or 55% just by normal variation. But if it comes out very different from that, so if it's outside a normal range of variation, then that seems like evidence that the coin is not fair. So as we move away from 50% and we move close to, for example, uh, 70 heads or 80 heads or 90 heads, so we are getting too many heads according to the uh, fair coin. Uh, there should not be that many. So uh, that provides evidence against the null hypothesis that the coin is fair. Now the strength of the evidence is measured by something which is called a p-value, which we will uh, also discuss in this lecture. So the first thing to do is to define the range of normal variation. So we will take this to be the interquartile range. The first quartile is 25%. And then we have the middle 50%, and then we have the last 25%. So the middle 20, 50% is taken to be the normal variation because half of the time the coin will end up within the interquartile range. For any variable, the interquartile range is half of the outcomes. So uh, for anything which is outside this normal variation, the chances of this will be less than half while the chances of being up to this value will be more than half. So uh, those are 
in some sense, evidence against the hypothesis that the coin is fair. Uh, by the way, this is standard terminology to say that the null hypothesis is the hypothesis that the coin is fair, and it is this hypothesis that we are trying to test. Here in one picture is the summary of the basic lesson that we are going to be covering in this lecture. Uh, we considered uh, testing a fair coin by flipping it 25 times. So now it turns out that the central values are 11, 12, 13, and 14. And these four values combined have probability of about 52%. So this is the interquartile range, the middle four values. Outside this range, so if you have 15, coin, uh, 15 heads, uh, this is too high. Uh, and as you increase the number of heads from 15 to 20 to 25, you get increasing evidence against the null hypothesis. Similarly, if you have too few heads from 10 to 5 to 0, uh, this is also increasing evidence against the null hypothesis that the coin is fair. So basically, uh, this is the general picture. And one thing that needs to be added is that we are going to try to measure how strong the evidence is against the null hypothesis of the fair coin. So to implement this program, we need to know how to find, how to calculate the range of normal variation for a fair coin. So for this, the first step is to calculate the probabilities of the outcomes. How many heads do you get? And what is the probability of getting that many heads? Uh, we will discuss this later. Then we uh, look at the interquartile range, which we can compute once we have these probabilities, because you go up to about 25% probability and you get Q1, the first quartile, uh, going up to 50% gives you the median and going up to 75% gives you the third quartile. So the range between Q1 and Q3 is the central range which has 50% probability. And this is the range of normal variation. Any point outside this range, uh, it has probability less than 50% and points up to this probability has probability more than 50%. So uh, points outside this range are, in some sense, unusual. So to calculate probabilities of a coin, uh, these are called binomial probabilities. And we're not going to go into a deep discussion of this, just some bare basics. Those who have done it already know it, but we're not going to teach this calculation in this lecture. Uh, but some basic facts will be given. You start by counting the all possible sequences. So if you have 10 flips of a coin, then um, and at every flip, you have two possibilities, either heads or tails. So you just multiply this 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 by 2, 10 times, and you get 2 to the power 10, which is 1024. And that is the uh, total number of possible sequences of heads and tails. And uh, the thing about fair coins is that all of these 1024 sequences have exactly equal probability. And this probability is equal to 1 over 1024. So that's the first step. The second step is to count the number of sequences with the specified number of heads. So if I want to calculate how many sequences are there with zero heads, I just count how many there are. And with zero heads, it's easy. There's only one sequence, and it has all tails in it. Uh, and so if there's only one sequence, the probability of this sequence is 1 over 1024. Now, when you get to two heads, uh, uh, when you get to one head, then there are 10 such sequences because uh, you can put one head in the first position or in the second position or up to the 10th position. So there are 10 different sequences, all of which have one head. So the probability of these 10 sequences is 10 over 1024, which is approximately 1%. And that is the probability of seeing one head. Uh, similarly, you can calculate the probability of two heads. And this turns out to be 10 times 9, uh, 90 divided by 2, which is 45. In general, if you have n um, a sequence of n flips and you want to find out the probability of k heads, you have to use the formula n choose k and the probability is this number n choose k divided by 2 to the n which is the total number of sequences. 
we're not going to discuss this formula but this formula is implemented in Excel and we can use the Excel formula to calculate these probabilities this is what we get when we calculate the probabilities for the case of 10 flips of a fair coin the probability of zero heads the, the number of sequences with zero heads is 1, so the probability is 1 over 1024. The pro number of sequences with one head is 10, and um, this is also um, a 10 over 1024 probability. When you get to two heads, it's 45 sequences, and this is 45 over 1024 as the probability, and so on. So the table lists the number of combinations that you have for each of the five possibilities from zero to five. Notice that these probabilities are symmetric. When you have five heads, you also have five tails, and the probability of tails is the same as the probability of heads. So the probability of zero heads is uh, one and uh, over 1024, and the probability of 10 heads is also one over 1024. Now using these, you can calculate the range of normal variation by uh, looking at the central values 4, 5, and 6. 5 has probability 25% and um, 4 has probability 21%. So if we combine the probabilities of 4, 5, and 6, we can get up to 67%. Uh, so this is the central, the interquartile range. So all of these numbers, 3, 2, 1, and 0, are outside the range of normal variation. So they provide increasing evidence against the null. If you see 3, it's a little bit of evidence against the null. 2 is more evidence, 1 is even more, and 0 is the strongest evidence against the null. Similarly, if you see 7, 8, 9, or 10 heads, these are also providing increasing amounts of evidence against the null hypothesis that the coin is fair. Uh, we have said that 7, 8, 9, 10 all provide evidence against the null, but how much evidence? Uh, measuring the evidence against the null is done by the p-value. Uh, this p-value is rather um, uh, complex and confusing when you, it comes to interpretation. What does it mean? In particular, one thing is important to note that p-value is not the probability of the null. That is a common confusion. But we are not going to explain the philosophy of the p-value or the meaning of the p-value. We're just going to concern ourselves with how we calculate it. And so uh, I'm just going to explain how this is done. So given any outcome like uh, number of heads equals eight, we have to define the tail event. The tail event is everything which is like eight or even less likely. So we collect all the events which have equal probability or smaller probability. When you are looking at number of heads equals 8, then 9 has smaller probability and 10 has even smaller probability. And also on the other side, 2 has the same probability as 8 and 0 and 1 have smaller probabilities. So the tail event for the outcome h equals 8 is 8, 9 and 10 and also 0 and 1 and 2. Now, if we add up all of the probabilities in this tail event, that is the p-value. And this p-value measures the strength of the evidence against the null. Um, as we have said, we're not going to explain why and what it means. Uh, that will be discussed later. But basically, after you compute the p-value, then you have uh, Sir Ronald Fisher gave a rule that if the p-value is 5%, this provides significant evidence against the null and the p-value of 1% provides highly significant evidence against the null. So this is a useful rule of thumb. Uh, if you don't have any particular information, then we can apply this rule. But uh, this rule must be modified according to context, according to our personal knowledge of the particular real-world event that we are trying to judge. We show how we can calculate these p-values. If the event is 8, then the tail event is 0, 1, 2, 8, 9, 10. And you can calculate the probability of all of these six outcomes combined is 10.9% or almost 11%. If you look at the event 9, then the tail event is 0 and 1 and 9 and 10. And that has p-value 2.1%. And, 
and the 10 has the tail event 0 and 10 which is 0.2 percent only so according to fisher's rule 10 is highly significant if you see 10 heads then uh, you have a strong rejection of the null hypothesis of fairness if you see nine heads then you have 2.1 this is significant but not highly significant means that we should reject the null but um, it's not so certain as before and with eight heads uh, the p-value is only 11 percent which is not significant so it means that at eight we should not be rejecting the null so the so we have um, as we discussed earlier, 7, 8, 9, 10 are all unusual events, but 7 and 8 do not really provide uh, much evidence against the null, so we don't have, we don't reject the null hypothesis, but 9 and 10 provide significant and highly significant evidence against the null. So according to a rule of thumb, we can reject the null hypothesis uh, with 9 and 10 heads. To clarify the concepts discussed, we give a second example of them with 50 flips instead of 10 flips this time. So um, we are trying to test the hypothesis that the coin is fair. To test it, we flip it 50 times and we look at how many heads we observe. And now the probabilities of different number of heads are given in this table using the binomial probabilities. So 25 is the middle value. Uh, the median value and this has probability 11.23 percent which is rather small um, now um, if you look at uh, number of heads from 0 to 14 these are very far from the central value of 25 and they have very very small probabilities so we don't tabulate them uh, from 15 15 has a 0.2 percent probability it's very small and 16 has 0.44 and so on. At 18, we get to 1.6%. So th this table gives us the probabilities of uh, different numbers of heads. There is one important thing that we should point out here. The median value has probability only 11%. Uh, so th this is a, a common confusion among students. This is the exact 50% value, 25 out of 50. The value of this exact uh, amount goes to zero. It becomes smaller and smaller. But actually, the law of large numbers says that approximately 50% value has chance going to one. So 100%. So it's not the when you flip the coin large number of times, like 1,000 times, you won't get exactly 500 heads. Uh, in fact, the chances of getting exactly 500 heads out of a thousand are very, very small. But approximately 50% heads will be true and the uh, uh, approximation will become better as the number of heads increases. So this is uh, a common confusion about the law of large numbers. Now, using the uh, Excel functions, we can compute the range of normal variation in this. Uh, there is a Excel function called binome dist and you have to specify the k which is the number of out outcomes that you want to compute the probability for, n which is the total number of flips, p which is the probability of heads which is 50% and whether you want the cumulative distribution which means add up all the probabilities up to this value or the individual one which means just the probability of this outcome. So for 25, if we write binome dist 25, 50, 0 0.5, and false, false means that we don't want the cumulative distribution, then it uh, gives us 11.23%, which means that the probability of seeing 25 heads out of 50 for a fair coin is 11.23%. Um, if I look at 22, this is the uh, first point at which we get about 24 percent probability which means that if you look at add up all of the probabilities of the outcome 0 1 2 3 4 5 all the way up to 22 and uh, so this is the what the true is telling us that this is the cumulative distribution you get 24 percent that means that 
22 is the first quartile of the binome distribution. So the uh, 22 is on one side and 28 is on the other side. And so the middle values 23, 24, 25, 26 and 27, they have 52% probability. So this is the range of normal variation when you flip a coin 50 times. So basically among these five values, if you see a coin come up from 23 to 27, you have no reason to suspect that the coin is not fair. So a fair coin will range between these values uh, without any difficulty with 50% probability. So outside this range, we start to get uh, evidence against the null. And um, we have already seen, so for example, if you want to calculate the uh, p-value for 15, then you have to add up all of the probabilities up to 15, and that is the cumulative probability, which binome dist with true gives you. And that the Excel tells us is 0.33%. To get the p-value, you have to double this because you look at the 0 to 15 and also the exact same symmetric events on the other side of the central value 25. So the p-value for 15 is 0.66%, which is highly significant. So if you get heads from 15, uh, from 0 up to 15, you have a highly significant rejection of the null hypothesis. And similarly, on the other side, from um, 15 is uh, 10 less, so 35. From 35 to 50, you have a highly significant rejection of the null. At 16, the probability goes up to 1.53%. This is significant. 17 is also significant rejection of the null. But at 18, you get uh, to below 5%. So um, from 18, 19, 20, so going from 18 to 25 and then from 25 to 32, so the range from 18 heads to 32 heads has p-values of um, greater than 5% means that they do not provide significant evidence against the null hypothesis. So this is outside the range of normal variation, but it does not provide. So these all values from 18 to 32, they provide a little bit of evidence, but not enough to, uh, to uh, decide against the null hypothesis. From 17 and 16, we get 60, uh, significant evidence. And from 15 and <clears throat> below, we get very strong significant evidence. This is all just rules of thumb according to Fisher. When you actually study the problem in a real world situation, then you have to use decision theory. You have to decide on how much loss you will incur if you make a rejection of the null hypothesis when it is true. And also what happens if you accept the null hypothesis when it is false. And you have to consider the outcomes and consequences in order to make a good decision. So. Uh, this is going beyond the, uh, the simple rule of thumb that we are discussing here. So to conclude this lecture, we note that studying a fair coin doesn't seem very closely related to association. We will see the relationship in the next lecture. Basically, if a drug gives you a higher rate, so for example, in the control group, which doesn't receive any treatment, cure rate is 50%. But in the treatment group, the cure rate is 60%. So 60% is higher than 50%. But is this difference purely due to chance? Or is it true that the drug actually has a genuine effect and is genuinely helpful in curing? So to answer this question, we need to study the properties of the fair coin. And that is the relationship that we will uh, discuss in the next lecture.